In this video, I want to talk about allusions and how they are used in um, three different sonnets. Um, allusions are always a lot of fun. There's something collage-like about them. You know, an allusion is a reference to another text or something from pop culture or something from Greek history, Roman history, Greek mythology, the Bible. I mean, the, it, it, an allusion can refer to anything. And they always have a sort of collage feel like to me where you steal a little something and you add it into your um, particular text. It can give what I call a scent of authority, you know, where it just sort of refers back to something and sort of like seconds the poet's opinion. Um, it also can just be fun and funny to refer to something. Um, it also could be a participant in the big tradition of poetry, capital T, T tradition, where it's like my poem is connected to the other things that came. Um, and sometimes it's uh, used, well, it just depends on the poem as for what it's used for. Um, I'd like to start with this very weird poem by E.E. E. Cummings, um, a sort of bohemian Greenwich Village, New York hippie kind of poet. Um, and it's called Next to, of course, God, America I. Um, and it is such a wonderful little poem. Um, it is one long, like it's such strange formally. It's interesting because of its illusions, but then it's also interesting in its form. It's basically one long speech, right? Here we have this guy, and he's talking, and this is what he says. And our narrator is separate from him, um, the speaker, uh, the actual writer of the poem. Um, we can see this because there is no punctuation here. It's all jammed together. Even some words are sort of combined together in a weird way that makes you want to speed up when you read it. But at the bottom, we see we have a complete sentence, very simple. He spoke, capitalization, period, sort of separating uh, the speaker of the poem from the guy who is speaking in the poem, and it opens us up to the world of satire. Um, that is what this poem is doing. It's making fun of what we might call mindless patriotism, um, jingoism, uh, patriotism. E. Cummings was a world uh, was a war veteran, and he did not appreciate uh, what we might call chicken hawks. People who are happy to send other people's sons to war and not actually fight in the war themselves. Uh, people who are afflicted with, you know, just simple-minded jingos um, about America and aren't really genuine in what they're saying there. Um, they also do a lot of tipping of the hat toward religious beliefs because they know that's what, you know, everybody really wants to hear, even if they actually aren't particularly religious. So <laughs> one, of, uh, one of my friends says this poem opens with a smarmy tone, and I think that's exactly right. You know, uh, the politician says, next to, of course, God, America, I love you. You know, there's two things. There's God first, and then America, and that is who I am. But you pretty much don't believe this guy right from the beginning. You don't realize it's kind of an anti-war poem um, until you get toward the bottom half of the poem. It doesn't have, you know, a, a striking volta between the octave and the sestet. Instead, the volta occurs in the last line where we separate um, the, the last line of the poem from all the, what I call the gobbledygook of the speaker up here. Now, the speaker is not drunk, even though you might want to think he is because he um, is speaking such nonsense, but we see that he drank rapidly a glass of water. Now, I, I do enjoy the rhyme of slaughter and water, although some people don't like it. And I also like the rhyme of butte and mute. Um, although a lot of my students tell me that, you know, that's cheating to split up the word butte a little bit, but I'm sort of tickled by it. Um, what we have, I mean, I should say this right away, is this is a Shakespearean sonnet. I mean, it doesn't look like it, but if we read the rhyme scheme, it is an A-B-A-B -A -B kind of rhyme scheme. I, O, oh, my, go. Worry, dumb, gory, gum. Butte, dead, slaughter, instead, mute, water. So it gets a little mixed up at the end because it doesn't have that final rhymed couplet. Um, but it's still mostly Shakespearean. Now, what about the illusions? Well, the illusions here are what I call to Americana. There's certain pieces of Americana, you know, that we all sort of recognize, like the Liberty Bell um, or Paul Revere, um, the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. Like these are like little phrases that we know that just say America to us. And here we have two, um, right? Um, one uh, we hear all the time, which is the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early... Um, so we have the Star Spangled Banner. The other patriotic song that he refers to is, um, you know, one that I sang a lot in elementary school that I don't know that people sing very much anymore, which is My Country Tis of Thee, right? 
um, land of the pilgrim's bride, land where my fathers died, all that sort of stuff. Um, and we see that I underlined the, um, the allusions for you, so you can see that he's grabbing bits of jingoistic Americana and slipping it into his speech to make him seem like he is you know, a true American, when actually he's sort of indifferent to uh, the, the cost of, of war. Um, so you got to read it kind of in one breathless nonsense. Um, imagine, you know, like whatever channel you hate of the news, whether you're a conservative or liberal, just imagine you're watching that channel, the channel you hate, and the person you hate is up there just spouting it all off. And we always, we call them talking heads because they literally just sit there and talk. And that's kind of what this guy is like. Next to, of course, God. America, I love you, land of the pilgrims, and so forth. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early my country? Tis of centuries come and go, and are no more. What of it we should worry? In every language, even deaf and dumb, thy sons acclaim your glorious name. By gory, by jingo, by gee, by gosh, by gum. Why talk of beauty? What could be more beautiful than these heroic, happy dead who rushed like lions to the roaring slaughter? They did not stop to think. They died instead. Then shall the voice of liberty be mute? He spoke and drank rapidly a glass of water. It actually all is a question. I'm not sure what question he's asking, but I can definitely tell there's some deep irony here around the heroic happy dead. Um, very hard to be happy if you're dead, um, but this guy is sort of nonchalantly, without much real concern, sending other people's sons off to war and calling it beautiful. Reminds us a lot of uh, Wilfred Owen's war poem, Don't You at Decorum Est, in some ways. Um, I love this poem because of its stylistically weirdness. Um, and I also like the smarmy tone because I do know every time I turn on the news, this is who I see, particularly if they're a politician. Um, and I do like the, the references to Americana songs that I'm particularly fond of. Now, the next sonnet that uses an illusion, it's kind of like the entire poem is an illusion, and it's an allusion to an American myth. This is called Superheart by Marion Shore, and it refers to the Superman myth. Um, which most people know, you know, sort of like one of the classic immigrant stories. He immigrated here, uh, Superman immigrated here from Krypton, his planet that blew up. I listed all the things in the poem that are referred to, right? That Superman has superpowers, that he's fast as lightning, he lives in Metropolis, he has a fortress of solitude located weirdly at the North Pole. We know that he came from destroyed planet Krypton, bullets bounce off his chest, he can fly, and he has one weakness, which are fragments of the planet Krypton that blew up um, and when he was sent to Earth, you know, because his parents were saving him. Now, this poem is a love poem. That's what makes it terrific. And it does remind me of a lot of pop songs that I like to refer to the American myth of Superman. I think of Superman as one of the great American myths, and I think of, like, The Wizard of Oz as another great American myth. But it's one long sentence. Um, and it's mostly Shakespearean, although some of the rhymes won't please you. You know, like, earth and north in the same. They, they have consonants, um, but they don't, like, fully rhyme. And that sort of bothers people a little bit. And victim and krypton, if I say it that way, it rhymes with victim a little bit more instead of krypton. Um, enough and love, we see quite a lot. <laughs> you know, people tend to cheat a lot when they rhyme with love. They just don't want to use the word dove, which is, like, over-clichéd. Um, we, we see that it is Shakespearean in rhyme scheme. Powers earth, towers north. Victim enough, krypton love. Feels subdued steel, solitude, flight kryptonite. It ends with that good old rhymed couplet. Um, we also notice that it's divided into half, right? This is the introduction of the metaphorical conceit of the poem, that I am like Superman. But we don't know that I am like Superman, meaning the speaker of the poem, until we get to that I part. Remember how sonnets often start external, out there, you know, sort of talking objectively about something, and then they get personal as they go to the bottom? It's a good technique that a lot of the poems use. And she, the speaker of this poem, presumably a woman, I'll just go with Marion Shore's name, um, she is like Superman, right? That's basically what she says. Like Superman, with all his superpowers, cruising at lightning speed around the earth, or leaping from Metropolis' towers, or soaring toward his fortress in the north, his mighty prowess never falling victim to any weapon save for, strangely enough, a fragment of his long-lost planet Krypton, wounded by what he could not help but love. So I, too, lately, had come to feel invulnerable, 
the enemy subdued, the bullets bouncing off my heart of steel, safe in its arctic fortress of solitude, or rising up in solitary flight. And then you came along, my kryptonite. Um, this would be maybe another Volta, right? Like, this is definitely moving from the simile to the personal um, identification of the simile. But then we have something happen, and then you came along. Along came Polly. And you were what? You were metaphorically my kryptonite, the thing that I could not help but love. I thought I was safe. I thought that Cupid's arrows or bullets were bouncing right off my chest. I thought I was safe in my arctic fortress of solitude. Or I thought that I was safe by running away from everything in solitary flight. But then you came along and I fell for you hard. You were my kryptonite. Cheesy, but charming by, uh, uh, by all means. Now, now the last poem does depend on you maybe coming from the Christian tradition and recognizing Christmas carols, um, but I'm particularly fond of this poem. Uh, it has four Christmas carols, similar to E. e. Cummings' allusion um, to Americana. Here we have four Christmas carols. O come all ye faithful, the twelve days of Christmas, O little town of Bethlehem, and just by one word, hark the herald angels sing. And it's basically the story of a father holding his daughter's hand um, and meditating on the world at Christmas time. Um, famously the song, O come all ye faithful, the next line is, joyful and triumphant. And those are two very positive words. You are joyful and you are triumphant. And the speaker of this poem looks around and he wonders how many people in the world are feeling joyful and triumphant. Mostly, he sees trouble, but then he also sees some hope as well. So it's a good poem that mixes hope and despair, joy and trouble, um, darkness and light. Um, and so I've underlined all the times he sort of refers to joyful and triumphant, the good contrast to the poem, or the times he refers to um, other uh, Christmas carols there. Um, so let's read it. December by Gary Johnson. A little girl is singing for the faithful to come ye, joyful and triumphant, a song she loves, and also the partridge in a pear tree, and the golden rings, and the turtle doves. Oh, that's one quatrain, right? Like, that, that's one idea. In the dark streets, we sort of back up the camera, from the little girl to the dark streets. In the dark streets, red lights and green and blue, where the faithful live, some joyful, some troubled, enduring the cold and also the flu, taking the garbage out and keeping the sidewalk shoveled. Not much triumph going on here, and yet there is much we do not understand, and my hopes and fears are met, and this small singer holding on to my hand. Onward we go, faithfully, into the dark, and are there angels overhead? Hark. Hark means listen or pay attention to. He's saying, there's a lot we don't understand. Sometimes we look at the world and we want to despair of it. There's, um, there's not a lot of stuff looking good right here in the middle of the poem. This would be the low part of the poem, right? There's troubled people enduring colds and flus and doing the normal stuff of taking the garbage out and keeping the sidewalk shoveled. He says there's not a lot of triumph here. And we have that volta at the end of a line. Kind of unusual, isn't it? Um, but there's much we don't understand. And the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. They're met in the small singer um, where they go faithfully joyful and faithful into the dark. And he asks us, maybe there are angels overhead. Maybe you're just not looking close enough. Maybe you're not listening hard enough. And he just gives us an imperative last word for the poem, hark. Sort of a beautiful mix of allusions to Christmas carols that um, tend to create a lot of positive emotions in a lot of people, and so the poem lifts us up through its use of illusions.